For this lecture, we're going to go to a part of the world that we've ignored up until now in the class, and that's Southeast Asia. The time period we're going to be looking at is from about the year 500 to around 1500. Obviously, Southeast Asia is located in the south and east of Asia. It's south of China and east of India, as you can see in the map here. And the region is heavily influenced by both of these larger societies. However, unlike those societies, this region has never been politically united into this, you know, larger, greater Southeast Asian empire. And the reason for that are there are mountains and dense forests that contribute to the political decentralization of the area. Just like you had in ancient Greece, just like you had in Japan for a long time, the geography of the area, the landscape, contributes to this political fragmentation and the fact that the, the states that arise in those areas are generally smaller than you've got in places like China. And in fact, this region has never been politically unified. Just to show you some examples of what I'm talking about, uh, here's a picture from Vietnam. So you can see uh, that again that it's a, it's a mountainous area. This is a picture from, from Laos. So this is the kind of landscape that you're dealing with and here's some of the, the rainforest that's down in the more the Malay Indonesian area. So when you've got a landscape like this, when you've got a lot of mountains and a lot of dense forests, uh, you, the societies that tend to arise tend to be the ones that are sort of, you know, in between these mountains, like, okay, on this side of the mountain, we're like this, and on, on the other side of the mountain, we're, we're a different way. But some significant societies do come up, and I want to focus on a couple of them. Uh, first up, Vietnam. Vietnam was conquered by Han China, and it was ruled for China uh, by China for about a thousand years or so. So they have a similar governmental system to China. They had their own civil service exam. The Confucianist philosophy took hold there. They they won their independence in the year 939. So. And when they did that, they defeated a, a larger, a much more powerful Chinese army. And the way they were able to do that is they used guerrilla warfare. That is, the, the soldiers uh, would you know, attack the Chinese soldiers uh, and then go and hide in the, in the jungle. They would, they would attack suddenly and then they would hide. They wouldn't meet the Chinese army in sort of open battle. Uh, they would do these, these smaller pitched attacks and they did so many of them that eventually the Chinese empire said, you know what, forget this. It's not worth it. Let's leave. And they uh, abandoned Vietnam. They left never to come back. The China, Vietnam is going to do a very similar thing when France comes in and colonizes them about a thousand years later. Uh, the Vietnamese uh, take a very similar tactic towards the larger, more powerful French army and they defeat them the same way in the 1950s. Then again, after that, the United States gets involved in a war there about 50 years ago and we we are defeated. The United States Army uh, ends up leaving Vietnam. The United States Army much more powerful than the Vietnamese Army, but we're the ones that leave, and the tactics they use against us really are very, very similar to the ones they used in the 900s against the Chinese Army. So Vietnam has a, a history of defeating larger, more powerful states uh, using uh, guerrilla tactics. And here is just a nice picture from Vietnam. Next up, we have the Empire of Anchor, sometimes called the Khmer Rouge. Eh, don't worry about that. Just call it call them Anchor. Uh, they're located in present-day Cambodia, which is right there. If you remember our, our map from earlier, Anchor at one point is a very powerful kingdom. Uh, they're influenced by. India, that meaning, and when I say that, I mean they have cultural influences from, from India. They are powerful for a while, but not in the end, because in the end they're destroyed by Thailand in 1432. Uh, but they leave behind uh, these spectacular, famous temples from you know, the time that they existed. Here's a picture of one of them. 
the most spectacular, most beautiful, most famous temple that they left behind is this one right, right here, Angkor Wat. It's gigantic. You can see how big it is right here with uh, the gentleman standing right there, but it's even bigger than that. It's, it goes way back. It is, they used as many stones building this as were used to build the Great Pyramid in Egypt. It's, it's this sort of spectacular, very famous uh, ancient temple that people like to go visit and here's some, here's some Buddhist monks. And again, in present day Cambodia in, uh, in one of the old temples. Next up, we'll go to Thailand. Thailand, you can see, located right there. The Thai people were originally from the southern Chinese frontier. Uh, they migrated into uh, what, was, what was then the Anchor area, and they conquered that kingdom in 1432. Uh, Thailand still exists today, still a country today. Uh, Thai society is a unique blend of Chinese and Indian cultures. Uh, Buddhism has been very popular in this area since it arrived you know, some 2,000 years ago and remains or retains its uh, influence today. Here's a picture of, again, some ancient structures in Thailand. This is one of the earliest pictures uh, drawn by some European uh, merchants who arrived there who were drawing what the city looked like back then and you can see this is a modern picture the importance of Buddhism still today. Next up we're going to travel to Burma which is located here modern day Myanmar and Burma was founded by people who originally migrated from Tibet. Uh, they were early converts to Buddhism which remains the, uh, the dominant force in the area today. Uh, they set up a strong centralized state, uh, somewhat influenced by India. These are just some pretty pictures from the area that I like. Again, you can see the influence of Buddhism, and uh, you can see there's some you know, people enjoying their food. All right, now next up, let's go to the Mal Malay Peninsula and the Indonesian archipelago. Archipelago, if you don't remember from geography, just means a group of islands. Today, this area politically, uh, you divide up between Malaysia, and this is the Malay Peninsula right here, and Indonesia, which includes all of these islands. Uh, so today, it's basically two political units, although I'm simplifying, there's a couple more in there. But way back then, they were very politically fragmented. Uh, again, that's big do uh, owing to the geographic fragmentation produces uh, political fragmentation. This is frequently true throughout history. The, the region displays a strong cultural influence from India. Starting in about 1400, Islam grew in popularity in the region. And today, Islam is the largest religion there. This is just a nice little map of the spread of Islam, and you can sort of see when it arrives here. It's after that initial explosion that we discussed a couple chapters ago, but you can see it arrives here and it spreads, and, and today, Indonesia is the largest, as in most populated, uh, majority Muslim country in the world. Uh, here's a picture of a mosque from Malaysia. Uh, these are uh, people celebrating uh, a much older tradition uh, in the area. And that is all I have for you today for Southeast Asia. I hope you've enjoyed your tour of this part of the world.